I'm Michelle. And I'm Daniel Coombs. And the and January's, January's What's, What's Need starts, starts right, right now. now. The What's Neat Show is sponsored by Lombard Hobbies, your value hobby shop for over 40 years of modelers helping modelers. Big inventory, value pricing, fast shipping, and great service. This is What's Neat in Moderarity for January 2021. I'm your host, Ken Patterson, and this month we do have a good show in that I share with you four different ways to model Ponderosa pine trees for your model railroad layout. Also this month, we've got a great interview with Dennis Krausman, and he shares his beautiful Santa Fe layout in HO scale. I would like to thank Lombard Hobbies in Lombard, Illinois for helping support the What's Neat show and helping us to promote the best hobby in the world. And I would like to remind you to please watch the What's Neat This Week video podcast on YouTube. That's a show where we keep you updated every single week on what's new in the hobby with special guests, new products, and the latest news on everything that's going on, again, in the best hobby in the world, the hobby of model railroading. And with that, let's continue on with the rest of this January 2021 What's Neat. segment of What's Neat, we're going to discuss building beautiful ponderosa pine trees and using them as scenery on your layout. In HO scale, N scale, O scale, or large scale, these trees work great. In the real world, in the prototype, these trees are absolutely beautiful. They grow to be very tall, and as the trains run through the scenes, the trees working their way all around as beautiful vegetation simply complements the overall prototype scene as you can see in this video footage right here. Now first of all I want to talk about these trees that you see here. These are from Grand Central Gems. They come in a package like this and in this case I've got the medium trees which are about three or four inches tall. These trees come from about one to two inches all the way up to, I've seen them about eight inches or nine inches tall, ready to go, already pre-made, and they're not very expensive. I ordered these by going through my Wathers catalog to find out what sizes were available before I went to my favorite hobby shop and purchased them. They also come ready to go with snow on them. They make for wonderful winter scenes. I've used them in various scenes and they do look great in outdoor sunlight on mountain snowy type scenes as you build for your layout. One other thing that I like to do, and that's gonna be the purpose of this video today, is to make the taller ponderosa pines that accent these smaller trees on your layout. These two types of trees work together, make for very effective scenes, whether you're building a mountain or a tunnel, or you're simply using the trees and their vertical height to create a scene block on your layout, or simply just cover up the whole train as a train runs through the middle of a pine forest. It's a very effective, neat way to model a model railroad, whereas you don't even have to build a mountain, you can just depend on trees to create your view block and your scenery vertical. Now, what we're going to do, and the way we start out making pine trees like this, is we generally start out with a dowel rod. It's the dowel rod that is the main trunk of these tall trees. Now, in HO scale, I like to use quarter inch dowel rod to make trees that are as tall as 60 feet in HO scale height. I like to go with 3 8 inch dowel rod to make trees that are more close to this 85 footer that you see right here. Now I've seen people model these in G scale and O scale. And in G scale, they get pretty big around the base, maybe almost an inch in diameter. And then you then work up the tree as you taper it. 
and that's the first step in the process is you need to take the dowel rods that you purchase after you have them cut to the right length that you want we need to taper them from what they originally start out with and then work them up to the top of the tree where the dowel rod gets much more thin now there's various ways to taper dowel rods and I'm going to show you a few ways to do that and in fact if you look at these skewers that you use for making shish kebabs these are already just about the right length for a small tree if you cut them right about here and these are very small about an eighth of an inch in diameter so they make for great 30 or 40 foot tall pine trees and they look just fantastic and if you think about it it's also just about the size of an HO scale telephone pole anyway which is where our telephone poles generally come from our trees just like these so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the various ways to start tapering the dowel rods I will share with you three ways that I have found to taper dowel rods for making our tree trunks in this first example I have a drill running at 1000 rpms it is clamped into a metal vise the dowel rod is set in the one half inch chuck of the drill I use a horse rasp to carve and taper the 3 8 inch dowel rod. As I move the drill back and forth, the dowel rod rests on a 2x4 giving support as I let the rasp cut into the wood. After about 5 to 7 minutes, the dowel rod is tapered into what will become our tree trunk. Another way to taper a dowel rod is by using a Stanley Shore Form Planer to cut and carve the tree trunk down to size. This method takes about 20 minutes to complete. I find it is best to wear a glove to prevent from getting blisters on your skin. While it is more arm work to do it this way, the end result comes out pretty good. The fastest and most easy way to taper our dowel rods is to chuck them into a drill press. You'll want to set your drill press speed to its highest setting and in this case I've set it to 3000 RPMs. I also wear gloves and I use two horse rasps at the same time to cut the dowel rod on either side at the same time down to a taper. Using the drill press like a lathe saves a lot of time in the event that you are making a lot of trees. Be sure to wear gloves to protect your hands from the sharp rasps edges. Total carving time using this method is about two minutes. I also follow up this process using 60 grit sandpaper to smooth out the grooves that the rasps tend to make in the wood. To create the carved tree bark effect in our tapered dowel rods, I find it's best and most simple way to do it is to run the rasp up and down the dowel parallel cutting grooves into the tree making for a trunk like effect that looks relatively good when it's finished. To color our tree trunks I like to use Minwax dark walnut stain. This gives a rich dark color to our trees that looks realistic in outdoor sunlight. Another way to color our tree trunks is to color them with Rust-Oleum Stone Texture Spray Paint. This sprays on with a multicolored texture type finish that makes great looking tree bark for our tapered dowel rods. I also like to use this paint when I'm making wire armature trees, deciduous type trees. To create a base for our trees, I cut the head off of a six penny finishing nail. I then drill a hole into the bottom of our tapered tree trunk using the drill press. Then I super glue the nail into this hole. This makes it easy to stick the finished trees into our foam scenery when they're finished. So here you see the different types of tree trunks that we've created out of our dowel rods by simply shaving them down into the right shape. Now the, these three on this side were again painted with the stone, this Rust-Oleum American Accent stone color, which gives a really nice bark effect. The ones on this side I then stained with, of course, this beautiful dark walnut stain, 
and then I sprayed a little bit of camouflage brown over that just to give it a little bit of different shade of brown in addition to the stain. So these two are stained and painted and these are then painted with simply the stone texture type paint which gives a nice bark effect. So now at this point the next step I want to show you the various ways to add greenery, branches, and turn these beautiful sticks into gorgeous ponderosa pine trees. So now we want to finish our ponderosa pines, now that we've got our bark trunk structures completely built, by coating them with the foliage, the different types of branch structures that we're going to make to put around our tree trunks. There's multiple ways to do it, and I'm going to show you four different ways that I know about to do this. The first and easiest way to do it is using a furnace filter material that's generally called hog's hair. And what this is, this is not fiberglass. This material you can get at True Value or any of your hardware stores. It generally comes in a package just like this. And what it is, it's a fibery natural material. And it makes great branch structures for our trees when we break this down into small pieces. And I'm going to show you how to do that. The next type of material that we're going to use, I found this ferny looking artificial plastic material at Hobby Lobby. And I've never tried this before, but just the design by structure, it looks like it would make beautiful branch structures for making pine trees. Another material that's tried and true, it's been used for years in our hobby to make uh, pine trees, is this Caspia. This is a natural product. You can generally find it at a hobby shop where it's dry. I actually purchased this material today fresh and have been drying it for almost eight hours. And it also makes great looking branch structure for making pine trees. The last material that we're going to try, I've never actually tried before, but I know it will work, is we're going to use these Bachman wire foliage branches. We're going to strip all the material off the branches and simply use the wire armatures as the branch structures for our pine trees. So we're going to start with the hog's hair, and I'm going to briefly describe to you and show you the process that is used to make pine trees out of hog's hair. You start by taking this material and stripping it off of the screen material that it comes on, and you want to break it up into small sections, about like this, and then you want to start spreading it apart. It's kind of thick, and it's in layers, and as you pull it apart, you'll end up with smaller pieces of what I will call branch structure. And this material is then slid down onto the slid down onto the um, dowel rods that we had made. And here on this tree, you can see where I've placed a lot of the material on all of these the same fashion. It's been placed over and around the dowel rod. What I do is, after I put it onto the dowel rod, these small sections, and I'll pull one off so you can see how big it is. It's not very big at all. I then super glue these onto the dowel rod st tree structure, spacing them about a half of an inch apart. And what you end up with is a tree structure that looks kind of similar to this. After it's been super glued into place, I then take a pair of scissors and I trim it so that it's got a st structure that looks more like a pine tree. Symmetry is what I'm trying to say. So it's wider at the bottom and it gets smaller as you go all the way to the top.
after it's trimmed, I then take Rust-Oleum Camouflage Brown Spray Paint, and I like to spray the structure, the, the little branches, just to tone them down. Because sometimes this material comes in bright green, and the colors that I've got here are actually dark blue. So I spray it with paint, just to make it look a little bit more realistic. After it's sprayed with paint, then we're going to come across, and we're going to flock it, spray it with hairspray, and then cover it with fine ground foam. I like to use Woodland Scenics Medium Mixed Green Fine Ground Foam when I cover these up. Then to further enhance this tree structure, you can come along with a static grass gun and use some green static grass to create the effect of pine needles over all of the foliage. And what you end up with, as I will show you in these photographs, is a very beautiful looking pine tree that's very quick, very easy to make. You can make a lot of them very quickly. And as you can see from these that are, are not finished yet, the structure is very easy to obtain once it's slid over your dowel rods. The next tree that we're gonna make we're gonna start working with the Caspia, and I will show you how to do that next. So now I'm gonna show you how to make pine trees using this Caspia. I picked these up at a florist and spent all day yesterday drying them. The ones that I've gotten in the past and the first time I've ever made trees using this method was about 1985, when in fact I made some beautiful trees. I'll show you a picture of them right now. And they came out really great. So, the process for doing this is, I've got my Dremel, and you can use a drill press, or you can use a pin vise if you want, to drill the holes into our tree trunk. The Dremel is much quicker than using a pin vise. And all I'm simply doing is I'm drilling the holes into the piece of wood, all the way around the piece of wood, Similar to that of the way they used to do artificial Christmas trees a long time ago. I'm drilling the holes with a number, uh, a drill bit that measures about 45 thousandths of an inch in diameter. So it's just a little bit smaller than a sixteenth of an inch drill bit. And I'm drilling the holes all the way around the tree trunk, working my way up. I'm drilling them relatively straight into the tree trunk and the reason for that is as we put the caspia in it's going to kind of droop down and I'm going to use white glue and I'm going to stick these caspia branches into my holes and I'm going to work my way all the way up the tree and all the way around the tree as I continue to add more and more of these branches as I go along. Using the Dremel motor tool, I took my time and drilled a lot of random holes working my way up the tree trunk. These holes are where the Caspia branches will be glued into place with white glue. The Dremel worked really well for this as I went along slowly. On the next tree that I do, I've decided I am going to use the, the, the uh, drill press because the process will be much faster, but so far so good. Once I had all the holes drilled, I started working my way up the tree. I trimmed the caspia pieces off of the branch structure and laid them out on the table, measuring the larger ones for the bottom of the tree. And then as I worked up, the branches would get smaller and smaller. As I dipped them in the white glue, 
I made sure that the branches drooped down in a prototypical looking fashion similar to that of what you see on a lot of pine trees. As you see as I work my way towards the top, the tree is starting to look finished. Now granted it's purple, so we're going to paint it and flock it with coloring and it'll dramatically change the appearance of this tree when it's completed. So after spraying the tree with brown, I've used that Rust-Oleum camouflage earth brown paint to paint all of the wonderful Caspia branches a dark color. I then took some camouflage green paint and I sprayed the tops of the tree with a little bit of green. Now what I'm going to do is hit the whole tree with some wonderful Aquanet hairspray and flock the entire top of the tree with Woodland Scenics mixture here of blended turf. And I'm going to get the bottom as well. I want to make sure that the trunk of the tree doesn't have any green on it, which I'll go through and clean that off. And what we end up with is a Caspia, beautiful Ponderosa Pine, just like that. After I put the green ground foam onto the Caspia tree, I took a paintbrush and I removed the uh, ground foam that was stuck to the trunk of the tree as I worked my way up. This brush was stiff and it easily removed all of the um, green from the trunk. So next comes the wire foliage branches from Bachman. These are already pre-flocked with greenery and they're simply wire armatures that have already got the foliage on them. So this would make for great wire branches starting with the longer ones at the bottom and the shorter ones at the top. We're going to cover the next dowel rod with these and the principles can be exactly the same where I'm going to use a drill bit, drill holes into this and then stick all of these branches into the dowel rod. As I work my way up the tree, I'm pulling the flocking off of the wire armatures on this. And I've started again with the longer ones at the bottom, the medium length ones in the middle, and eventually I'll get the smaller ones onto the top. And I'm simply dipping them in glue, pressing them into place, and kind of bending the wire armatures at a downward angle. It's not a fast process, but I think this tree might come out pretty beautiful when it's finished. And just like that, this tree is completely wired up with branch structures. And on the very top, I drilled a hole straight down. And I'm putting in a branch right on the very top, sticking straight up. Just like that. And so that's the Bachman wire brush, not brush, but the wire armatures on a dowel rod. It makes for a beautiful looking armature so far. So I'm going to flock this with Woodland Scenics um, flocking, and then I'm going to go ahead and use static grass on this tree. I think that'll look absolutely fantastic. So now I'm going to put Woodland Scenics fine ground foam on this wire armature tree and we'll clean the ground foam off of the tree trunk in the event that it sticks to it, and I'm sure it will.
then next we're going to put static grass on this. And I think that'll make a big difference for creating pine needles on this uh, branch structure. Again, I'm going to wet the tree with hairspray. And I'm going to wet the trunk this time so I can get good electrical contact down to the nail for the static grass applicator. Now I've got short nap grass in this. I don't have any long static grass at the moment. But I think this will suffice as I turn the gun on. You'll see it's attracted to the tree as I start shaking it. Clip came off. Let me clip it back on. It's absolutely amazing how this works. Look at that. like that we've got the pine tree with the pine needles on it made from the Bachman wire armatures now I've got a stiff paintbrush and I'll go through the center trunk and wipe off all the static grass that's sticking to the trunk areas clean that up a little bit it's just like that and that'll take a little while so next we're going to try making a tree Burn looking plastic material that I picked up at Hobby Lobby. Now for our last pine tree, we're going to use this ferning material that I picked up at Hobby Lobby. There's no way to identify this other than a tag on here. And it's got a simple number on it of 1727551. It's a product number for those that might want to search this out. This is a great looking material that's got really a pine tree effect looking branch structure. And what, what I've been doing is, first of all, these have got metal in them, metal wire. So you cut this with a pair of wire cutters. And then you work your way down, cutting each size difference of branches and I've been sorting them out on the table and just as we did before we're going to take the larger branches at the bottom of the tree and work our way up to the top of the lodgepole pines of the trunks as we work along. Process will be exactly the same whereas I'm going to drill holes into our dowel rods and then insert the beautiful branches into the dowel rods and then we'll figure out what covering that I do, whether I flock them or whether I static grass this plant. So let's, let's see what happens next for our last final pine tree for this segment of What's Neat. So I've added 32 branches up to this point and I'm three quarters of the way up the tree. And it's having great effects. Right now I'm putting on the medium sized branches which are about a scale 10 feet in length and I'm working my way up, putting each branch into the white glue and then sticking them into the holes that I've drilled into the uh, trunk of the tree.
so after about an hour, I put almost 50 different branch structures on this dowel rod, and this is the plastic fern material um, from Hobby Lobby. Now this would look great if we simply just painted it with an airbrush, a darker shade, and it would look very realistic just the way it comes. But I think what I'm going to do is go ahead and put very fine Woodland Scenics ground foam on this and hairspray and see if we can add a little more texture to this tree. So let's go ahead and do that. To put a little bit on the bottom as well just fill it in good i don't see the need to put static grass on this tree i think it looks dynamite just the way it's coming out and just like that this is our fourth way to make ponderosa type pine trees pretty neat so I brought all of our pine trees out in real sunlight so that we can have a recap and see exactly what we've done now with the four different ways that I've shown you now to make different types of pine trees. First of all, the hog's hair furnace filter trees. You can see how they look in real sunlight. They're very quick and easy to make and I think they're effective. Also the Caspia pine tree. Again, all the detail, the beautiful branch structure, I think that's an, also a neat way to make trees. And of course, the Bachman wire armature tree that we flocked with static grass to represent all the individual pine needles. Again, I think that's a beautiful tree. Look how great that looks in sunlight. And the last tree is using the plastic fern, that artificial plant looking material that I picked up. Again, another beautiful way to make pine trees. There's a lot of different methods, a lot of different ways to do this. I've shown you just four in this video. And with that, let's call this a segment, a great segment for what's neat. That is this segment for what's neat. For this segment of What's Neat, I'm with Denny Krausman here in Colorado, and I've, I'm looking at his beautiful Santa Fe layout that he's built. Lots of aisle space, just great looking layout. Denny, tell us about this layout. We're really excited to see it on What's Neat. Okay, well, what I've tried to do here is recreate the Santa Fe Railway and basically the passenger main line that was went through southeastern Colorado. And I picked the time frame of 1948-1949 because I love steam and I wanted to have war bonnet diesels and some early generation diesels. So that's why I picked that time frame. Um, I'd also had uh, the opportunity to be in the southeast Colorado area once back in the 90s and was able to say this is where I want to create my Santa Fe Railway because it had an opportunity for me to add a branch line that came out of Holly as well as the passenger main line that went through that area. And of course I don't build mountains so I wanted something that was flat and so that was the perfect area for what I wanted to do in the time frame. Uh, so then for the next five or six years I spent time down there taking pictures, gathering pictures so I could figure out what everything looked like in 1948-49 so I could recreate it. Uh, and that, that's really uh, the layout in a nutshell. And I grew up on a farm in central Iowa and our farm was bisected by the Milwaukee uh, main line that went from Chicago to Omaha. So I saw trains running up and down through our farm every day 24-7. And I had several relatives that worked for the railroad too, so I kind of had this subliminal, subconscious desire for trains, and I've always loved things mechanical. I mean, growing up on a farm, that's how you learn, you know, mechanics is part of it. So that was always there, and then in, in, at Christmas of 1974, my wife and I have two daughters and I was putting doll buggies and houses together, and I told my wife, I need a hobby for me. I need my toys. So the day after Christmas, I went out and bought my first HO train set. I had a Lionel growing up. 
and I mean it just blossomed from there. I just everything that I wanted to do, uh, I, I'm. I wouldn't say that I'm a select craftsman in any way, but it was a it was a way for me to build things with my hands and and to do things. And my passion has always been since I got into it, scratch building. I love to scratch build cars, buildings, uh, everything, and I like to recreate the the prototype. Uh, everything I've tried to do here is should be fairly close to prototypical. So that's my real passion. And of course, over the last 40 some years, uh, it's it's blossomed into what you see here. Now this is my third layout, one in Sioux City, Iowa, where I started. The next one was in Parker, Colorado, and this is my third layout here in Lone Tree. So this is very nice. Now. Uh, you've got minimum radiuses. Uh, I don't know how many feet of track you got here. There is in just in the um, mainline track here exposed. There's 150 feet lineal feet. Doesn't count sidings or anything else. Uh, but just basically 150 feet are running, uh, plus another 75 feet, uh, almost 80 feet of branch line. So uh, gives everybody uh, plenty of places to run. I, you know, I do like operations, obviously, <laughs> as you can see from the car cards and the, the way bills. Um, so, uh, and then if you add all the track you can't see, like in the helixes and everything else, if, if you go down through the helixes, through the staging, which there's a balloon track, you can do that, uh, you end up with over 400 feet of running. So it gives you a at least you can run a train for a few minutes before you have to stop so i like that i appreciate you showing this we can really see your passion for trains denny thank you but uh yeah so this is southeast colorado uh somewhere along the line i had a, a great great uncle who was a passenger conductor on the santa fe railway and i'd seen pictures of him and of course growing up everybody knows what a lionel santa fe uh, war bonnet scheme looks like and so in about oh the late 90s well early 90s I decided what I wanted to do was recreate something in Santa Fe and I happened to be working down in southeast Colorado and saw the Santa Fe didn't see passenger trains by then but uh, said this is what I want to do because I could build a branch line I could have flat main lines uh, not a mountain builder so uh, that's how this came about. So it took me about, I don't know, five or six years of thinking, planning, and drawing plans up, and then realizing that my wife wanted to move. So I, the plans got thrown away. We bought this house, and I redrew the plan so I could put the Santa Fe layout here. So It just fits just right in this room. Yeah, it, it, it worked well, so I was happy with that. So and have decent aisle space, not huge, but decent aisle space for operating. So uh, that's where we got to here. And of course, I've always had a passion for steam. And growing up as a kid, you know, I saw Milwaukee steam still running in the 50s uh, through our farm. So I wanted to create a time frame where I could have steam, but I also wanted war bonnet diesels. So that's why I ended up with late 48, early 49, so I could have both. I see you've done a lot of research and that's awesome. Tell us about the height of the layout. This looks like a perfect height. What What is your rail height on this? 54 inches. That's great. And your minimum radius, it looks like it's got to be, what, 48 inches or uh, it, Actually, minimum radius is 36 inches. This so. is nice. And I see car cards all over as we look up and down the aisle here. Um, you do operation, is that right? I do operations. And of course, that was part of designing the layout and uh, was to have it so it could operate so there would be plenty of places to do local switching right uh, as well as create several yards where uh, people could re who like intense switching can. how many people does it take to operate this layout Denny 12 so you've got 12 guys here and do you pick a night during the month that you do this do you do this regularly I do this regularly um, and we have been meeting on Friday evenings we're going to switch now to Saturday afternoons that just seems to be a better time uh, people get tired on a Friday evening <laughs> no the scenery is absolutely beautiful your valence lighting looks really neat the way you've encased it into your uh, concoves over the top here this is just a great design well thank you um, I actually I had seen several layouts in Kansas City that had something similar 
And I said, I like that because I'd been on several layouts where it had balance and lighting like that, but you'd look up and you could see all the wires and the lights. And I didn't want that. I, I kind of wanted that hid. Um, someone told me once that you should design your layout so that the focal point is the layout. It's not your balance. It's not your lighting. It's, you know, the highlight. So I tried to keep everything in kind of an off-white, uh, hide the lights, make them effective so they light up and you see the layout. That's what it was all about. I am so impressed with this. It is beautiful. Thank you, Denny, for sharing this with us on You're What's welcome. Neat. Thank you. All of the products seen on this episode of What's Neat are available from Lombard Hobbies in Lombard, Illinois, or order online at LombardHobby.com. <laughs>